know, the greatest theological truth that a person can come to is to realize that God is good. And the greatest act of worship that a believer can live out is to have that willingness to uh, say yes, Lord, to his will and to his way. Can you say amen? You may be seated. Well, last week was a great week at Christ Church. We had a couple of baptisms that took place in this 11 o'clock service. And, you know, baptism is so important. It's central to the life of a Christian. And when we see others be baptized, it reminds us that the kingdom of God is on the move. And it also should remind each of us of our own baptism that we have surrendered our lives to the point of death and that we've been raised again to walk in the newness of life. Well, while baptisms took place here last week, halfway around the world in Japan, a couple of more baptisms took place. Yes. And so here we see a video from Kyoto Central Chapel. This is Masashi being baptized. He was the drummer that was here during the summer that, uh, yeah. And <laughs> Amen. And then also being baptized was Nahiro, and Nahiro was the, the young man that was here that played the flute, and um, we're going to see him be baptized as well. What's great about these guys is that on our going away party, they told us that they were not Christians, but sure appreciated Christ church and our love and hospitality. Well, as we can see here, they're being buried in the name of Jesus for God's glory, and uh, we're so excited. And... And while we're doing our best to influence Japan for the kingdom, I want you to know, after watching these baptisms, we're going to start holding people down in that water just a little bit longer than we have been. Amen. So, uh, well, in serious note, Pastor Yasu wanted to talk to us as a congregation, so let's pay attention to what Pastor Yasu said. Hello, wants. Nashville. Hello, Christ Church. I'm Pastor Yasu. And today, Masashi and Naohiro become Christian. And thank you for your hospitality, uh, especially uh, uh, this summer. Your team came to Japan, and uh, our team went to Nashville, and they are the fruits of your evangelization. So next year, we will come to Nashville uh, with my choir. So see you next year. Thank you very much. Yeah. Amen. Those of us who have been to Japan, we realize that um, we have sort of a, a special affinity, especially because we, we got to know these young men, but spending quite a bit of time with them while they were here and while we were there. But we know that it was this congregation that paid our way to do that. And I hope that you in your own heart are celebrating in the work of the kingdom that you are a part of. And we have a couple kingdom workers that are uh, back in town, and I can't help but just take a moment to acknowledge. And we have Sandra Wimpleberg finally back from leading camps and retreats. And uh, she's been gone for, for many months. And then I understand that uh, one of my kids, Ryan Bledsoe, is back home, and so we're so glad to see him. And uh, God is good. Would you stand? We serve an awesome God, and He deserves all of our praise and glory and how we live and how we sing and how we do church. And so today, I invite you to press in as we invite the presence of the Lord to be with us. Father, we thank you for your awesomeness and your goodness. We thank you that you've called us to know you and to walk with you in faith and obedience. Father, I pray that you would be exalted in all things that we say and do here today for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Contend 
They feel no shame at the sound of your great name. Every fear it has no place at the sound of your. And all the world will praise your great name. Oh. All the weak find their strength.
very core of us that you created to do just that, to praise you. God, that we would choose that daily, that our hearts would sing no other name, not our own name, not somebody else's name, not some title that we're going after, nothing else, Jesus, but you. In your name, amen. So be it, Lord. Amen. If right now I could have the incredible prayer warriors who are on our altar team to just come up to the front. And these are our altars this morning. We don't have the traditional altars, but this is the space that we believe that the Lord has set apart for personal and corporate prayer. And I just want to encourage you, if there's anything on your heart this morning, anything at all, if you want to rejoice with somebody, this is a safe place to do that. If you want to offer something that you have never told anybody before, this is a safe place. We don't go around saying, oh, did you hear this? Did you hear this? This is a safe place where you can just be wherever you are. And we believe that the Lord wants to meet you here this morning. Why else would we be here? (laughs) But we believe that he is here and wants to meet with us. And yesterday, or last week, if you were here, we had a powerful time of prayer as those prayer cloths, and we still have some of those down here, and anointing oil, and if you want a a prayer cloth or to be anointed with oil, this is a place for that. And so as we just enter in that time, just ask the Lord if there's something that he wants to show you this morning. And if you wanna pray in your seat, there's freedom for that too. The Lord is everywhere, he's not just up here. But this is a time where we can just press in deeper and see what the Lord has for us. And as we sing that song that says, just says, Jesus at the center of it all. Nothing else matters. Nothing in this world will do. It's a powerful statement that we say. And so just continue with us in this sweet time of worship. Jesus at the center of it all. Jesus at the center of it all From beginning to the end It will always be, it's always been you, Jesus 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 at the center of it
to you and we thank you for the stirring that we sense in this place of your spirit and your presence God what mighty things happen when we just turn our heads and focus them on you Jesus and that's what you're doing you're captivating our gaze individually and as a church God and we praise you for that this morning and we give it all to you Jesus in your name amen you can have a seat as the choir continues to lead us in worship and there'll be a few um of our altar workers still up here during this time. If, if you still want prayer, this is still a place that's open for the Lord to come meet you.
the 11 o'clock service came to worship the Lord this morning. I could tell from the very, very beginning. Um, it's amazing to me. There was such a sweet, sweet presence in the 8.30 service, and I know I'm supposed to not compare. It was beautiful. It was very powerful and moving. But it's a, it, this, this service to, has a different personality, this one did. And um, you guys are ready to worship, and it is it's exciting to be here with you. Amen. Amen. And I have the best seat of all because I get to sit right there and watch the choir lead us into worship. And then I get to have the girls right here behind me worshiping and they sound so beautiful and they come so ready they're the first ones here and they're ready and um, it's just a beautiful place to sit so thank you girls for um, having my back and leading me into worship <laughs> well kids it is time for you to go to your classes so you can continue to learn about the Lord and who knows what surprises wait for you there in the factory. And I love to see them run. It's the only time they're really probably allowed without getting reprimanded. So run fast. And Christina is going to uh, tell us a little bit about what's going on this week at Christ Church. Good morning. My name is Christina, and here are just some of the events happening right here at Christ Church. The Christmas season is almost upon us, and our favorite way to get in the Christmas spirit is with the Christ Church Christmas Choir Concert. This year, it will be December 1st and 2nd at 7 p.m., and the doors open at 6 p.m. Every year, this is an incredibly special time of celebration as we join with our friends and neighbors in worship of our Savior's birth. Tickets are only $10, and they are available after the service in the foyer and in the upper atrium. Christ Church is in the process of beginning an online directory, and we need your smiling face to make it complete. December 6th, 7th, and 8th in the Martha Scott Hall, professional photographers will be on site to take you and your family's portraits. Everyone who participates in this process will receive a free 8x10, and your picture will be included in our database and directory. To sign up for a time to have your picture taken, stop by the bookstore or the concert ticket table in the foyer. And lastly, don't forget there are no Wednesday evening classes this week in observance of the Thanksgiving holiday. The church offices will also be closed Thursday and Friday. So have a great Thanksgiving weekend, everyone. And those are just some of the many great things happening at Christ Church. For more information on these events, check out the online calendar at ccnash.org or pick up a bulletin at the information desks. I have two other announcements. We uh, t today is the last day for the Angel Tree uh, application process. If there is, if you are a member of Christ Church and you ha are ex anticipating a difficult season this year, and you could be blessed by this project, please go to um, CC or Angel Tree at ccnash.org. Did I get that right? I can't see that far. I think that's right. Um, you can go there, and there's an application that you can, or some, you can submit your name, and someone will contact you and get more information from you. There are angels already on the tree upstairs in the atrium. So if that's a project that you want to participate in, please stop by and, and take one of those names. I'm sure a family will be so thankful that you have have done that. Also, Pastor Dan's sermon last week. He talked to us a little bit about the chaos and the, and the clutter and the stuff that we have in our own homes and that we need to get rid of that stuff and we need to put that back into circulation and we have a project that's coming up we're going to find out more information about that next week but it's called the big give and it's a very very simple way to help you declutter and to bless some people that are in our community and within this church and you'll you'll get more information about that so please, if you've held on to that clutter this long, hold on to it for one more week, please, so that you can learn more about what you can do with it and uh, be a blessing to this community. At this time, our ushers are going to come forward, and it's not offering just yet. We want to welcome any of our first-time visitors that are here at Christ Church uh, today. If you would do us a favor of just raising your hand so that we can identify you and hand, give you one of these cards. There's someone right here. 
Welcome. If you're, if you're a regular at Christ Church, if you would make them feel welcome um, with a round of applause. And also just make sure you greet them after service. We are so glad that you're here. You can fill that card out and you can either put it in the offering as it comes by or you can take it to the hospitality center, which is right on this level across from the bookstore. And there will be people there to greet you and you get with that little card, you can get a complimentary cup of gourmet coffee, I hear, and uh, pastries, so you can enjoy those and learn a little bit more about our, our church. We are really glad that you're here. I do have to say, Billy Goodman is back at Christ Church, and we are so thankful that you are here. It's such a blessing to see her um, around. She was here on Tuesday for the prayer group that meets, and it just, it just feels good to have her home. So welcome home, Billy. We're going to continue our worship of our tithes and our offerings. So if you would just bow your heads with me as we pray over that. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day, another opportunity, Lord, to spend worshiping you, Lord, thanking you for all that you've, you've given to us and all that you mean to us, Lord. And as we enter into this season of thanksgiving and a season of, of blessing, Lord, we, we, we give back to you in recognition, Lord, that you are the owner of it all. Everything that we have comes through you, and we thank you for that, and we recognize that. Lord, I pray that you would bless the, the finances that, that come in, Lord, and, and the, the way that we spend that. Lord, I pray that you give us wisdom. Lord, we want to proclaim your name. We want others to know about you, and we want to be a light, a beacon on a hill. Help us to do that, Lord. And we just ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
good heavens, that's good stuff. Man, wow. Well, uh, I've got just a little bit of housekeeping stuff here. won't take me very long. But uh, we have posters, and we invite you to take these and put them up anywhere that will, they'll let you. And if they won't, when their back is turned, put them up anyway. Uh, that's a joke. Um, not much one, but it is one. All right. Now, uh, 13 days away uh, on Saturday, December 1st, and Sunday, September 2nd, 7 p.m., and this year's concert's going to feature Sean Tate and Jamie Paul and Christy Sutherland and the Christ Church Choir. So you want to come and bring all your friends. <laughs> Tickets are $10, and they can be purchased in the atrium bookstore for you and so forth. And I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going to get a bunch of them and, and try to... You know, just give them to people, not just hand them out indiscriminately. Say, come with me to the concert. So I invite you to do that. And uh, so you have a business or anything that, that any public place you want to put these up, please do. And uh, this needs to go somewhere. There, on top of the piano, there it goes. All right. So we wanted you to know about that. I also wanted to tell you, I went to see the Lincoln movie. And it is awesome and good and you ought to go. I mean... I tell you what, it, it really uh, impressed me. And it, particularly if you're, if you're new to the country it, it, you're, or, you know, you, you, uh, you really want to know kind of what the heart of this nation is about, I think you'll really get it there. Uh, and I invite you to do that. And if you're, uh, if you're a, um, a, a person born and raised here and you've got lots of roots in this country and a citizen of this country, it, it just is uh, a, a wonderful a presentation of what is the best in our country. And so I was really impressed by it and was also impressed that so many people are going. That was really cool. I was pleasantly surprised at that. Would you stand, please? Colossians 3, 8 through 17. And this public reading here is from the, uh, uh, from the New Living Translation. But let's read it together. But now is the time to get rid of anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, and dirty language. Don't lie to each other, for you have stripped off your old sinful nature and all its wicked deeds. Put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your Creator and become like Him. In this new life, it doesn't matter if you are a Jew or a Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric, uncivilized, slave or free. Christ is all that matters and he lives in all of us. Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourself with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace and always be thankful. Let the message about Christ in all its richness fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom he gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. This is the word of the Lord. Please uh, shake hands with somebody before you're seated and tell them you're glad to see them, if you are. Now, we're all going, in, we're all going into the Christmas holidays, and that starts with Thanksgiving, and then we, we're going to see a lot of relatives and old friends and, and uh, acquaintances. So we really need this sermon because uh, it's called Stop Being Mean. But today's passage really hurt, hit me hard. I remember going through Colossians a few years ago, three or four years ago. Uh, Austin, my son-in-law, was memorizing the book, and we spent a lot of hours uh, discussing the book then. 
But there's sometimes that a passage really hits you and it won't let you go, and that's what happened this week. But Colossians chapter 3 begins with a command to believers, to us, and it says, Seek those things which are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, and then it says, Set your mind on things above and not on uh, of this earth. So it's seek those things above, set your mind on things above. And he continues with this, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Now, what does it mean to say, I have died? Well, I think it means that, you know, after I die, I'm not going to have much interest in things that preoccupy the living. Uh, my mind is going to be on different things, on eternal things. And that being so, Paul says, I should experience life that way today and as, a, as a Christian, like someone who is dead to this world and alive to the world to come. And then Paul continues uh, to instruct us, and he says that I am to put to death all the things in my life that are contrary to goodness, truth, and beauty. And he especially mentions these, fornication, wrath, malice, blasphemy, and filthy language. Put to death is a violent phrase, uh, and uh, it doesn't leave much room for compromise. It's end it, stop, quit, stop doing these things, get it out of your life, end of story. And then Paul says, there's some things I need to put on in my life, and among these things are tender mercies, kindness, uh, meekness, and long-suffering, and beyond this, he says, I must forgive everyone who has a complaint against me. Now, I'm going to tell you, I don't know anybody that can do that except the dead man. <laughs> I don't do it. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm angry with people that have a grudge against me, and I pray that they will soon come to their senses and understand how right I am and how wrong they have been. Uh, and uh, as I ponder on this passage, as it turns out, it's a lot easier to do church work and sing gospel music and press for Christian values out in the public uh, political world than it is to actually live a Christian life because that actually requires a transformed self. So I find all this stuff difficult, and so I made a decision this week, and I have really kind of had a lump in my throat saying this out loud, but I've, I've said it already uh, in, in another service. I've got to say it now to you. Um, I'm going to try for an entire year from today to not speak ill of any person, including public figures that come from any religion, political party, or socioeconomic group. I'm not going to say sarcastic things, humiliating things, or disparaging things of any sort about anybody. And I'm going to do my best to dismiss thoughts of that nature. And if I'm angry at somebody, I'm going to go tell them I'm angry at you, but I'm going to do that without insulting them or being humiliating to them or making sarcastic comments about them in their face or behind their back. And in this way, I am going to seek to bring the peace of Christ into my thoughts and my emotions and speech in such a way that Christ will be made visible in my life. I want to say that publicly uh, in order to make myself accountable to you and what that means is I want to be finished with being mean, even a little mean, to anybody. I want to learn to bless and not curse like the Bible says. So that means I'm finished with every kind of religious justification for hate or ridicule or anger against any person or group of persons. Because I'm resolved that in this church, the hurting and afflicted and addicted and lonely people of the world can come and hear the message of Jesus, come unto me all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I intend to be who I am and say what I believe and do what I think is right to do without undue concern about how others will respond, but I want to also do my best to graciously accept how others respond to me and be more concerned with how I respond to others. I'm going to work on banishing all forms of meanness out of my life. Now, the reason I want to do that is because in my heart of hearts, I believe that in the name of Christ, many of us have abandoned the ways of Christ. And therefore, I'm resolved to live as Jesus taught, whether or not that seems reasonable 
either that or abandon entirely the Christian faith. Because it seems increasingly unethical and devious to me to say we believe in Jesus while not paying attention to what he taught. If Jesus really is the Son of God and he's alive among us, then our lives ought to reflect that. And if our lives don't reflect that, and we never intend our lives to reflect that, then our faith is really a comforting myth and it lacks compelling reason for anyone to ever adopt it or practice it. Now, I hope you'll bear with me because I, you, you might think I'm going somewhere where I'm not, so please bear with me because none of this is about offense. But in our last political season, I've been grieved and ashamed at the way some believers have spoken and treated to one another. And they've said, many of us have said bitter things against public figures, including the leaders of our country and those who were seeking offices of public service. We got to repent of that and we, we got to do better and we can do better. Because the Lord said, do not let unwholesome communication come out of your mouth. If others choose to persecute or harass or belittle their fellow human beings, there's little we can do to stop them, but we can stop our own mouths. And we can stop our own ears in the, in the presence of unfounded gossip, unsubstantiated rumors, cruel and crude jokes about people and the like, and we can refuse to pass along Information about others that belittles, humiliates, or disrespects them. We can gently remove ourselves from the company of people, including Christians who do not govern their tongues or their internet communications. I don't mean that we can't disagree even passionately with others, but we cannot batter, belittle, mock, or insult people and at the same time claim to carry the name of Christ. We cannot say hateful things about Muslims homosexuals, Republicans, Democrats, the wealthy, or the poor. We can disagree with people. We can be passionate about our disagreements. We can be opposed to what people or groups of people do, and we can voice our disagreement. But when we do, we've got to always convey our deep realization that all human beings are made in the image and likeness of God and will live somewhere forever, and each and every one of them deserve our respect. In this past election, neither of our presidential candidates were uh, evangelical Christians. But both were pushed forward by millions of people to, because these people believe they offered our country what our country needed at this time in our nation's history. And for that reason alone, both of these people deserved our respect and both of them need and they still need our prayer. The leaders of our country face some of the most intense challenges faced by any generation of, of American leaders since the founding of the Republic. And they all need our prayer. They all need our heartfelt and persistent prayer. And so what we should pray is that God will use them and reveal himself to them and work through them to accomplish his divine purposes on the earth. I need to tell you, I, there are many policies of our president that I cannot affirm. Some of them are contrary to my personal political beliefs and I keep those to myself. Some seem contrary to my Christian beliefs, and at different times I believe it's my responsibility to address those things if they seem contrary to me on how I, how I view the teachings of Jesus. But if and when I do, even when, when I do disagree with the leader of the country or a governor or anybody in public service, I am as responsible as a Christian to demonstrate my respect for the man in his office as I am to articulate the reasons that I disagree with him. And I'm going to go further. And I'm going to say that if any elected official, Republican or Democrat, ever needs my services for anything, I will serve them, I will serve my country, my state, my city, as though it were service to the Lord himself. In this church, there are two judges, two city council members, one ex-congressman to the United States uh, Congress, numerous policemen, military personnel, and I want you to know that I honor each and every one of you. And if I have failed to show you respect in any way or ever made light of the work you do, that's an easy thing to do, to make jokes at your expense. And I want to repent. And I want to say political life is a calling for some people. And it's no more slimy or dishonorable than any other kind of vocation, including the calling to be a clergyman. I had a person of high office in this 
state come to me at the conclusion of the first service crying and thanked me and said, in this church, I always feel respected. I don't always feel that out, out in political life, but thank you. It was very kind, and I want to serve the Lord. But I want you to know, if you're called to public life, this is a safe church for you. I'm going to try to preach the Word of God, and from time to time, that may seem at variance with some political tenet that you hold, but I will never intentionally use this pulpit in a political way. I want to use it to strengthen your own work for God in the area which you have been called to serve our Lord. And please, brothers and sisters, if you are a Christian serving in political life, treat your fellow political leaders with respect. Don't scowl at them when they enter a room. Don't disdain or show disdain or disrespect about them when you address them or when you speak of them. If you dishonor other public servants, I'm asking you, why should I honor you? And this attitude extends to all people and all authority, all the people that serve us in some way, parents and teachers and police officers and pastors and anyone else responsible to govern and care for us in some way. Even when we disagree with them, we've got to be careful how we disagree. I'm a human being and I make mistakes and you can disagree with me, but if you, if you cross the line and you begin to dishonor the office that I hold, you're not in trouble with me, you're in trouble with the Lord. Paul says, in fact, live in peace with all people as much as lies within you. And Paul says, put on tender mercies and above all love, that is the bond of perfection. Now, if what I'm saying is unreasonable or it's idealistic or it's undoable, then let's quit pretending that we're following Jesus. Because what I am saying today is just repeating what our Lord said. And if our faith doesn't work, let's just admit it and move on. But let's not continue with the sham of praising Jesus while, act, while not actually paying attention to what he tells us to do. We are called to live differently than the people around us. We are called to live differently than the people around us. Paul says, let the word of God dwell in you richly in all wisdom, admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. In the end, you see, the world is not going to be brought to Christ at the end of a gun, and it's not going to be brought to Christ through the ballot box. We can't force the world around us to become obedient to the word of God. Jesus said, that the world would come to glorify our Father in heaven if and when they see our good works. So it seems to me there's only two ways which the unbelieving world is going to find compelling reason to become a Christian. First, if there is a demonstration of supernatural signs and wonders. If the sick are healed and the addicted and possessed are supernaturally delivered and the presence of God becomes clear and evident to those that come among us, when that begins to occur, the unbelievers will experience awe and they're open, they will open their hearts to the reality of Jesus and that he's alive and with us, that it's not just another religion or another philosophy of life. And we can't do a thing about that except ask God to grant us signs and wonders, and we should. The early church asked, asked the Lord to confirm his word with signs and wonders, and we should do that too. When the people are coming up and they're being prayed for and they're receiving prayer clause, I'm earnestly asking God that when they touch people that they will be healed. Jesus is alive. He's risen from the dead. But the world has no particular reason to believe that. The second way is through the holiness of our lives. And that that becomes evidence in us as we walk with God. I'm not talking about self-righteousness or uptight, controlling people. That's as repugnant and repulsive as any sin. What I'm talking about is a life of service and gentleness and wholesomeness that seems over and above what worldly people do. People who are life-giving and bring healing and joy to others in consistent ways are rare in the world. And they're signs of grace in a broken world and these people, we, we call them the saints, they, they suggest the risen Christ is really at work among us. 
But here, listen to this. If we lack either the sense of supernatural presence of God or holiness of life, what does the world look to as evidence that Christ has risen from the dead? If we expect the world to listen to us, we cannot be a lazy people. We cannot be an ignorant people. We cannot be a fearful people. We cannot be a hateful people. We have to demonstrate in our words and our actions and demeanor that we are a redeemed people. We've got to seek holiness, without which no person shall see the Lord. And we must love the Lord with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and our neighbor as ourselves. That means we've got to love our gay neighbor. And, and really, if we can love the gossipy busybodies that one finds in every church, people that bring pain and destroy our relationships, if we can love people like that, can't we find a way to love folks that struggle with sexual feelings toward their own gender? And we've got to love our Hispanic neighbors. Spanish-speaking Americans are here to stay. They're not going home because this is their home. They're a permanent feature of this country, and that started when we chopped off the northern half of Mexico and conquered Puerto Rico. The racial composition of our country is the result of slavery and the geographical expansion of our country and the constant flow of immigrants into these two continents since 1492. And the best thing we can do to ensure that our nation remains a Christian nation is to act like Christians to the newcomers. To demonstrate lives that are so compelling to the immigrants that they plead with us to learn the ways of God. If they instead encounter fear and anger and resentment, they have no reason to ever consider our faith. And brothers and sisters, we've got to stop rejecting Catholics and Lutherans and Anglicans and Charismatics and Presbyterians and Baptists. Anybody we think is not performing Christianity like we think they should. Unless we're willing to say that these people are not connected to God and they're not real followers of Jesus Christ, we've got to renounce all forms of sectarianism and spiritual pride that shames and discredits the ways others worship and struggle and structure their faith. We've got more than enough to worry about how to reflect Jesus in our own lives than to worry about how other people pray or worship. If you don't like it when people raise their hands in church, let it go. Let it go. You don't have to raise your hands in church. But what other people do is not your concern. If you don't like it when someone makes the sign of the cross in worship, let it go. You don't have to do that in this church. But you are free to do either. The Pharisees didn't like it when the woman poured oil on the Lord's feet and wiped it with her hair because it seemed so radically different to them. But Jesus liked it. Jesus liked it because she was praising him. And so you see, how people worship is not about whether we like it. It's about whether the Lord likes it. So you ought to be able to dance here. If it upsets you, do people move their bodies? And, and uh, I know I don't do it too gracefully, but I, I, know you, I know you ridicule and harass me behind my back. God's revealed that to me. And you'll be judged someday. But Listen. It's, it's not just about music, but that's fine. When the music is moving, we ought to be able to move our bodies. But the deal is some of us like, some of us move our bodies and sometimes I'd, it, it feels like I just want to twirl, uh, you know, and I know that wouldn't be graceful either and maybe it wouldn't be dignified. Uh, but God's done a lot of good stuff in my life. Praise God. I'm on my way to heaven because he saved me. And uh, I've got a lot of faults in my life, but he's redeemed my life. And there's people here that's been redeemed from cocaine and from all kinds of sexual perversions. And they fight a hard battle and difficult things. Some have battled poverty and disease. And uh, when, they, when they sense the presence of the Lord, they just want to shout out hallelujah. They, they just feel like they want to move something. And if they do that, please don't criticize them. You don't have to do it, but leave them alone and let them praise God in a way that they wish to praise God. 
And you ought to be able to kneel here. Sometimes I wanted to kneel, and I feel, it feels self-conscious, like, well, people like, well, la-di-da, look at that. But when I was a little kid in my church, my little Pentecostal church, when people would say, let's pray, almost always knees would hit the floor. What got into us all of a sudden that kneeling is something weird or bizarre? Sometimes we need to kneel or we need to bow our knee. We don't bow our knee to anything in this culture because we're the sovereign self and everybody's supposed to bow to us. But you know, one of these days I'm going to face the righteous judge when I see him. I don't think I'm going to like, whoa, Jesus, how you doing? I think I'm going to do what the Bible says, fall down his feet like one dead. There are times of awe and respect. We want to praise God. And you know what? If Jesus really is alive and he's in the house, when I sense he's in the house, my knees are going to hit the floor sometime. Amen. A few years ago, um, Steve Shima had an un- inoperable tumor. They, we thought it was inoperable. It was very, he'd had it taken out twice and they had come to the end of the trail. And, and uh, one, 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 um, uh, doctor in, in Virginia was willing to operate on him in Charlotte. And uh, uh, so uh, Jim Enoch, whose picture's hanging outside the prayer tower there, uh, prayed for him and said, well, when the doctors open your head in the morning, they're not going to find any, any, they say, he said he's not going to find anything there, which uh, gave uh, <laughs> Steve a shock, you know, but, uh, but um, uh, Jim, Jim would do things like that, and I'm like, man, that wasn't wise to say. You know, the doctors say, because they've, they've got a biopsy and an, all their CAT scans right there that they just took tissue samples through his nose just a few hours before. And I wasn't in the room, uh, waiting room, as that five-hour uh, surgery took place. And um, so Pastor Hardwick was there. You could ask him about it. You see him. Some of you may have been there. There was room was crowded, and there in Charlotte, and so the doctor came out and said, "I don't know how to tell you folks this, but here's what's happened. It's taken us so long because we were terrified we had the wrong patient, because there's no sign the tumor had disappeared, utterly, completely disappeared, and." And the, doc, the doctor was so moved, and he, he was tearing up, and he said, I called uh, uh, young people over from the medical center to see this. They're in students because I, I would told them from time to time, you'll see something in this practice. It's very unusual, but people believe that this is an answer to persistent prayer that was done on this young man's behalf. And he said, uh, so thanks be to God. Brother Hardwick said, everybody was silent, and in a minute, Knees started hitting the floor, bam, 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 silent. He said that was, everybody was in awe, and they just were silent. What is that? It's the glory of God. So we ought to be able to be contemplative and silent here when that's appropriate, and we ought to be able to shout out our praise to God here when that's appropriate. We should never worship as an exhibitionist, trying to impress or shock others uh, through the way we worship, but we should never speak ill of a person who worships God in some way that differs from us. Our church needs to be a place where it's difficult to be mean. We mustn't be mean in the sanctuary. We shouldn't be mean in the hallways and the classrooms. We need to be done with being mean because this church has to be a place where the Holy Spirit is not grieved by the way we treat one another or speak about those trying to find their way to God. It has to be a place where everybody that hungers and thirsts after righteousness can draw near and find grace to help in the time of need. And to do that, Paul says, above all things... We must put on love and we must let the peace of God rule in our hearts to which we are called in one body. We've got to learn to be thankful. We've got to learn how to let the word of God dwell in us richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another according to this chapter. So you see in the days ahead, we're going to need two things to occur if we expect unbelievers to discover God in what we say or do. First, we need supernatural grace of God to demonstrate his presence through signs and wonders. We need that. And secondly, we need lives that reflect some quality that unbelievers can't find anywhere else. You see, we are in now a supermarket of ideas in the world. You, you may have some Buddhists living next to you, and then probably they're very nice and courteous people. Some Muslims down the street may 
uh, have a Taoist or two here and there, some New Agers from California that snuck in past the immigration at the Tennessee borders. <laughs> they eat flowers and other strange things. And up and down your street, you may see all kinds of folks. And so the deal is, your idea is one among many. And in their mind, it is not privileged. And when you say, but the word of God says, they bring out the Quran, the Bhagavad Gita, or the sayings of, uh, of Confucius or whatever. And your book and their book is equal in their mind. You say, well, what do we do in a world like this? Well, one thing for sure, shouting louder will not help. <laughs> you know, there's a verse in, this, in, the, in, the, in, the, uh, uh, in the book of Acts that tells me what we need on one hand, and it is through many infallible proofs he showed himself to be yet alive. Through many infallible proofs. We need infallible proofs in our congregation of people that are able to say, I was this way and I was transformed and now I'm another way. I came into this church sick and the doctors had given me up and I walked out free and healed by the power and the glory of God. We need that kind of grace of God in our church. And sometimes we make it about you know, I, I sometimes see healing services on TV and I just have to turn it off and go have a cup of coffee and stare out, at, at this, out the window. It's not about showing off some kind of charismatic power in the preacher. It's about, uh, it's about pointing to the, uh, the authentication of the word that is proclaimed from here and from your mouth. That means when you're talking to an unbeliever and they're sick, you may not need to go on and on with the four spiritual laws and stuff. They have absolutely no interest in hearing. But if you'll tell them, can I pray for you? Can I give you a healing cloth? Do I believe that God does miracles? And if the Lord heals you or if he touches you or if he speaks to you, will you open your heart to receive him? Through many infallible proofs, he showed himself to be yet alive. And then our changed lives. We need to have changed lives. Last week I watched a documentary that Christopher and Amanda Phillips recommended from Netflix. It's called Happy. And it looked at, it looked at groups of people in this world that seemed to live lives of happiness and delight. And some were poor, some were wealthy. But they found out that once a person's basic needs are met in life, food and shelter, more money and more possessions didn't seem to make the people either more or less happy. That was just flatline on how happy they were. But also, religion didn't make them more happy. Some people found joy in their religious lives. Other people found their religious lives made them angry and frustrated. And some non-religious people seemed genuinely happy. Now, I looked at that and I thought, well, if a person is lost without God, happy doesn't help if you're lost, you know. Be like a person has cancer, you're happy because you don't know it. That's true, but it's also true that in a world where there are many religions, an increasing number of people with no religion there is little reason for anyone to believe our message about the existence of God, the resurrection of Jesus, our morals or values that we teach, unless our own lives demonstrate some quality that faith has produced in us. Ask yourself these questions. I've got six questions down here. Are Christians more responsible in your experience than unbelievers in how they view and manage their possessions? Are Christians wiser or more knowledgeable than their unbelieving neighbors in the field in which they work? Are Christians more dependable workers than non-Christians in the workplace? Are Christians kinder and more loving toward others than non-Christians? Do Christians seem to radiate more happiness and peace in their lives than non-Christians? Do Christians seem to demonstrate some kind of supernatural grace and power that non-Christians lack? Now, as you ask these questions, you realize at some point that we have left the unbelieving world with few reasons to even listen to us. And perhaps that's why we have become so frustrated at them for not listening to us, we have resorted to coercion. If they won't listen to us, we will force them to behave. And we've, if in doing that, we revert back to the Old Testament ways of dealing with holiness. 
This attitude toward the world is doing great danger to our witness, even among our own children. Too many of our own children are losing their faith or make, having their faith shaken because of things they have experienced from the hands of believers. Jesus said it's inevitable that offenses come, but woe unto those from whom they come. And if one offends one of these little ones, it would be better than a millstone were placed around his neck and he'd be cast into the sea. Offenses will come. Unfortunately, sometimes I will cause offense and so will you. But when we cause offense, we've got to quickly repent and do all within our power to seek forgiveness quickly, forgiveness of those whom we have offended. We're not going to be chums with everybody. There's lots of folks that I respect and admire very much, but from a distance, I, I don't really enjoy their company. I have personality conflicts. That's just life. We're all wired differently, and we'll never be able to see eye to eye on everything. But we all have to give up wrath and hatred and insulting language and needless offense, and all the like. Either that or we must give up our faith as unworkable and unrealistic in everyday real life. So I don't know what comes next for me except in this walk of holiness and walking after God except to take this small step in the direction of just leaving meanness behind. <laughs> I have no doubt it's going to be a struggle. I've thought about this week. I've had this week occasion to be angry two or three times, and I'm like, how do you deal with this? I mean, if you don't say that absolute idiot and if you haven't allowed yourself to say that and you've boxed yourself in by saying publicly that that's not the right thing to say what does one do you could do like Whippy Goldberg and Sister Act and say bless you <laughs> I suppose but I don't think that counts before God <laughs> we're supposed to bless and not curse and we're supposed to pl pray for those who despitefully use us and all this kind of stuff and here's the deal you see I, I'm going to be turning 60 in a few months and that uh, it, it, it's not depressing me but it weighs on my mind that it's a milestone in life there's just no doubt about that and I'm realizing that if, if some point if I really believe in Christ I've got to decide to become a Christian isn't it right? and that requires me to deliberately and consciously decide to stop being mean among many other things let me close by reading the third chapter of Second Peter and as you listen to this passage he's talking about the coming of the day of the Lord I want you to think about all the people around you who are saying now that we're in the last days. And I want to ask yourself how God wants us to prepare for the last days. Does he want us to prepare for the last days by being fearful or angry or hateful? You know what? It's amazing. Christians say, ooh, I'm afraid Jesus is coming. You know? I'm like, okay. Uh, that's a strange reaction from somebody that's looking forward to the coming of the Lord. Oh, the signs are all around us. Oh, signs are all around us. Jesus is coming. And Christians are going, ooh. And the Bible says when you see all these signs begin to appear, lift up your eyes. Your redemption draweth nigh. You're supposed to rejoice. Unless the Lord's particularly ticked at you. I mean, which may be. I don't know. So what, preparing for the last days, what the Lord wants us to do? He wants us to put on the ways of Jesus. Listen to this from the Apostle Peter. This is my second leader, letter to you, dear friends. And in both of them, I've tried to stimulate your wholesome thinking and refresh your memory. I want you to remember what the Holy Prophet said long ago and what the, our Lord and Savior commanded through the Apostles. Most importantly, I want to remind you that in the last days, scoffers will come, mocking the truth, following their own desires, and they will say, what happened to that promise that Jesus is coming again? For before the times of our ancestors, everything has remained the same since the world was first created. They deliberately forget that God made the heavens uh, by the word of his command and brought the earth out of the water and surrounded it with water. And then he used the water to destroy the ancient world with a mighty flood. And by the same word, the present heavens and earth have been stored up for fire, they're being kept for the day of judgment when ungodly people will be destroyed. But you must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise as some people think. No, he's being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. 
But the day of the Lord will come as unexpectedly as a thief. Then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise and the very elements themselves will disappear in fire and the earth and everything in it will be found to, observe, to deserve judgment. Since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, what holy and godly lives you should live, looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along. On that day, he will set the heavens on fire and the elements will melt away in the flames. But we're looking forward to the new heaven and the new earth. He has promised a world filled with God's righteousness. And so, dear friends, while you're waiting for these things to happen, make every effort to be found living peaceful lives that are pure and blameless in His sight. And remember, our Lord's patience gives people time to be saved. This is what our beloved brother Paul wrote to you in the wisdom God gave him. Speaking the things in all his letters, some of his comments are hard to understand, and those who are ignorant and unstable have twisted his letters to mean something quite different, just as they do with other parts of Scripture, and this will result in their destruction. But I am warning you ahead of time, dear friends, be on guard so you will not be carried away by the errors of these wicked people and lose your own secure footing. Rather, you must grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All glory to Him, both now and forever. Amen. Well, let me conclude here. I told this story, I understand, a few months ago, but it bears telling again. Since I forgot I told it, you couldn't have remembered it either. Either that or I'm turning 60. I'm forgetting everything. You can read this in the first chapter of Chuck Colson's book, uh, The Body. It's in, it's in uh, I believe, 1990, uh, Christmas season 1990, the, the Re Romanian Revolution. In Romanian town of Timisoara, the Reformed pastor was tipped off by someone in the police department that the police were coming for him that afternoon and he wanted to set the church in order. So that Sunday morning he said, Sam, you'll do this and Bill, you'll do that and Betty, you'll do that because they're coming to get me. I don't know when I'll be back. Just setting things in order. Finally, somebody said, no. No. This isn't going to happen this time. No. They're not taking you. He said, well, you know, it's the policemen. They're coming to get me. They said, no. So those 60 people got around him and said, you're not leaving, and they're not taking you, or we're all going together, one of the two. So a couple of policemen came in a while and said, we're coming for the pastor, and they're like, no, go home. You know, you're not, you're not getting him. I'm like, well, you know, this, no. So they said, this is unreasonable. I'm just going to go, you know, get more policemen. Fine, go get them. Well, they did, but by the time they got there, the Baptists had heard about it, and they had come and joined. So there's now about 150 people or so. And so there are all the Baptists and, and the Reformed people, and you're not taking the pastor. And so they're like, you know, this, this isn't going to work. It's going to turn out to be disastrous. They brought out some more policemen, various guards around and so forth. And so the hours were going by, and by this time, uh, the Pentecostals had come. So they had 300 or so people all around the pastor and like, you're not taking the pastor this time. So like, you know, we can't do anything about this. You know, it, it's going to happen. No, it's not going to happen. So anyway, some commander somewhere called out the army. The army came with tanks and surrounded the little church. Tanks and soldiers with guns. And they're like, we're going to mow the tanks over you and we're going to destroy the church building. It was getting really tense and at the ultimate hour now. And someone there wrote, and Charles Colson said, this is one of the most moving things he ever wrote about. He said, it was nighttime now, and we looked up, and suddenly there was a sea of fire coming down the boulevard. And what it was was the Orthodox people in, in the city had heard about this, and they were coming with their candles by the thousands. And they came and lined up in front of the church building, in front of the tanks, and lay down on the ground with their candles. And in a little while, one of the leaders of the people, Christians, 
said, because they didn't know what to do, said to the boys running the tanks, why don't you just join us in prayer? And the soldiers began to lay down their arms, and the tank commanders began to leave the tanks, and they lay down on the ground. And they were singing a song that day. I didn't know what song it was. I went there about six months later. I went to a little Pentecostal church in Romania, and that night in the Romanian is is uh, uh, close to Spanish and Italian, close enough that you can understand quite a bit, and uh, so I could pick up things. Uh, and the pastor said, "I hope it's not offensive to you, but before we start church, all Christians in the country were still singing our." Revolution song. Because you know, by the way, Ceausescu wouldn't let the people celebrate Christmas. Wouldn't let a Christmas tree go up, lights, anything. But uh, he was tried for his crimes on Christmas Eve, and he was hung. And they took every bush and tree in that country, and they lit it up with lights all over the place and sang Christmas carol, believer and unbeliever alike. It was part of the revolution. I thought that was cool, but I was six months later going to hear the revolution song. And here's what they began to sing. And I tell you what, I can still remember the chill bumps just going up and down my back, believing that this is the message that topples kingdoms. You know, I know we're concerned about our country, but our country is not going to be saved through revolution or through ballots. Or We do our best. We're citizens and we vote. But the weapons of our welfare are mighty through the pulling down of strongholds. We're people of prayer and fasting and prayer and healing. Here's what they sang there that night. In these the closing days of time, what joy the glorious hope affords. That soon, O wondrous truth sublime, He shall reign, King of kings and Lord of lords. He's coming soon. He's coming soon. And with joy, we'll welcome His returning. It may be morn, It may be night or noon, but we know He's coming soon. I've got two more verses to sing, and then I'll dismiss you. Listen. The dead in Christ who neath us lie, in countless numbers all shall rise. And when through the portals of the sky He shall come to prepare our paradise. He's coming soon. He's coming soon. And with joy we'll welcome His returning. It may be morn. It may be night or noon. We know. He's coming soon. Please stand. I'm going to sing this last verse. And be thinking about as we're concluding today. It's not a scolding sermon any more to you than to me. Let's resolve that we're going to be a place where those that need God can find God. They've had a lot of rocks thrown at them in life. Some they've messed up their own lives through all kinds of addictions and sorrowful behavior and stuff that repulses even them. And the world is messed up and dysfunctional. They don't need any more anger. They need to encounter the people of God saying, come unto me, all you weary and heavy laden. I'll give you rest. Lay it down. Praise God. And we who living yet remain caught up shall meet our faithful Lord and this hope we cherish not in vain but we comfort one another by this word 
He's coming soon, He's coming soon, and with joy we'll welcome His returning. It may be morn, it may be night or noon, we know He's coming soon. Lord, we are uh, people who, like Paul said, the things we wish to do we don't do, and the things we don't wish to do we do. And we are afflicted by our own sin, and uh, sometimes we give up the uh, search and prayer for transformation of life. And other times we take the path of rule following and getting angry with others who aren't following some of the rules we're following. Help us give all that up, Lord, and let us see you. Some morning, Lord, if it please you, if you just walk in. Of course, we'd all love it if you just walked in a visible form, just walked down to the front, we could see you. That'll happen in our lives sooner enough. But when you come in in glory and those that have heavy burdens find themselves lifted into joy and those who are sorrowful find themselves dancing and laughing and those who are imprisoned from their addictions and they can't lay them down, the cutters and people that sniff cocaine and the people that shoot up people who do things that repulse them. All of a sudden they're here ashamed and they don't know whether to try to live for you or not because they're so ashamed, feel ashamed to be here. All of a sudden they sense your presence and it's a loving presence. And they hear, come unto me all you weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. My yoke is easy and my burdens are light. Oh, God, fill Christ church with your glory and presence. Forgive us, all of us, oh, God, in any way we've offended you. And call us to holiness of life, our minds, our hearts. Teach us, teach us how to speak to one another. Order our steps by your word. Lord, fill us full of that supernatural grace that helps us able to say, I have not yet obtained, but I'm pressing on to the high calling that's in Christ Jesus. Let this be a place that radiates the glory and the character of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God bless you. Go in peace. Have a wonderful Thanksgiving.